This episode of Harvey Brownstone Interviews is brought to you by the Harvey Brownstone Talk Show Blend Coffee, available at hollywoodblends.com. Everyone's saying it's the best coffee they've ever tasted. Why not give it a try and see for yourself? Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today's special guest is an iconic singer and songwriter who's given us numerous top 40 hit songs, including How Do We Ever Get This Way? Look at you, baby, look at me. So in love we used to be. But now it's just a memory. Baby, how do we ever get this way? Shoot him up, baby. So shoot him up, baby. Shoot him up, baby. Baby, I love you. And though I'm really trying, I think I may start crying. My heart can't wait another day. When you touch me, I just got to say. So good together. Yes, we're so good together. I know it's happening, but I can't believe it. I just love this feeling that's going through me. Be my baby. Fire baby, I'm on fire. Fire baby, I'm on fire. Hold you all the good times that I I forgot to mention. To say that I love you would be an injustice. It's not that they don't like you. It's just they don't trust us. And of course, everybody's favorite. Rock Me Gently, which went straight to number one on the Billboard charts and remained on the charts for a staggering four months. Rock me gently, rock me slowly, take it easy, don't you know that I have never been loved like this before. He also co-wrote and sang on the enduring classic pop song, Sugar Sugar for the fictitious pop group, The Archies, which stayed at number one for four weeks and became Billboard's record of the year and the biggest selling record of 1969. And the song ranks at number 90 on Billboard's list of the greatest songs of all time. Sugar. Our guest has received top industry honors, including two Juno Awards. In fact, in 1970, he received the very first Juno Award ever given out, and it was for Male Vocalist of the Year. In 2004, he was voted by Canadian Music Week as the Best Solo Indie Artist of the Year. He's been inducted into the Songwriters Hall of Fame, the Canadian Music Hall of Fame, and Billboard's Hit Parade Hall of Fame. He has a star on the Canadian Walk of Fame, and in 2017, for the second time in their 70-year history, the Society of Composers, Authors, and Music Publishers of Canada, better known as SOCAN, honoured our guest with their Cultural Impact Award. Over his epic career, he has sold over 30 million records and has had over half a billion streams on Spotify and YouTube. And if all that weren't enough, I am absolutely thrilled to share the recent announcement that our guest will be appointed an Officer of the Order of Canada for his contributions to Canadian music as a trailblazer and legendary artist. And for those of you living in the Toronto area, our guest will be returning to Massey Hall for his 19th annual Christmas show on Wednesday, December the 6th for an unforgettable evening celebrating the magic of the season with performances from our guest, along with some of Canada's top music stars with all proceeds donated to the Centre for Addiction and Mental Health. I am delighted and deeply honoured to welcome the one and only Andy Kim to our show. Andy, thank you so much for being here. That's a long list you went through, and it just reminded me that I've lived a, a long and 
exciting life. And I will tell you, Harvey, I believe that God sent one of his angels and made sure that I was taken care of. And I uh, listened to you and can't thank you enough for having me on your show. Well, it's a great, great honor. And before we start the interview, congratulations on being appointed to the Order of Canada. What a magnificent and well-deserved honor, sir. I will give my gold records back because this one is the most emotional. I started crying when I found out about it. I thought it was a joke at the beginning. And what I cried about was the fact that my mom and dad, that never understood why I ran away from home and and got into the music world. They're immigrants, and we grew up in a tenement in Montreal, the third of four brothers, and I just was overwhelmed because to, to have Canada as a beacon for my mom and dad, and, and they've never stopped telling us how fortunate they were in this country. And and it's just, it's almost overwhelming, but I appreciate it so much. Well, it's extremely well-deserved. Every Canadian is so proud of you. Now, we all grew up listening to your music, but you grew up listening to the music of the Beatles, Hank Williams, Frank Sinatra, Elvis, Buddy Holly, Bob Dylan. But did you have any mentors as a young singer-songwriter to help guide your career? What helped guide my career was basically a transistor radio that my older brother Joseph owned. And in Montreal, the, you know, for me, at, at, a, at a young age, I'm, there was no traction for anything. And the way I grew up was almost like my destiny was all, always predicted. And so WKBW in Buffalo and WABC in New York became the hollow ground that I needed to kind of bring myself to, especially New York City with WABC, the way they talked about the artists, the way they said they were coming to town and they were performing and, and the crowds. And I really started dreaming for the first time. I I don't think, you know, I've had dreams, but I've never had vivid dreams of what I could accomplish in my life. And, and it was those moments that gave me the courage to really say, you know, I can do this. I'm not a great musician. I just started to learn when I got to the Brill Building and in the offices of Lieber and Stoller and Jeff Barry, Ellie Greenwich and Phil Spector and so many other people. And I learned my craft from them. So if you can identify, what would you say was the most important career advice you ever got when you were down there in New York? You're only as good as your last two minutes and 30 seconds. Really? That's what you're told. And so, therefore, I understand how that goes. You know, it's like, How Do We Ever Get This Way was my first hit. And so it gave me the opportunity to record and shoot him up. Baby showed up. It was the wrong time and the wrong title. It was released the day Robert Kennedy was assassinated. And uh, newspapers throughout New York and throughout the country talked about the fact that this song is about either guns or drugs. And I don't do either. And, you know, guns scare me. And so do drugs, to be honest with you. So I really took kind of an emotional beating because I felt that the record company would drop me. And then, you know, there was a couple of other songs and then Baby I Love You showed up. And and then the Archies showed up. And, and for me, that was kind of a turning point. Well, now, some people may not realize that you had so much trouble trying to get anyone to produce your song, Rock Me Gently, 
that you created your own record company and produced it yourself. Did that turn out to be a blessing in disguise, Andy? <laughs> well, in retrospect, yes. Economically and and structurally for myself. But I had moved from New York City to Los Angeles, wrote a song one morning at about six o'clock in the morning. I just, it's kind of a good time for me to write. And I figured I didn't know anyone or any musicians, so I decided to to produce myself, see what I could have learned all these years being in New York City. And I found myself not knowing anyone, so I called a buddy of mine in New York, and he says, why don't you call the Musicians Union? So I called them. And I said, you know, I'm looking for, and I told them guitar players and a drummer and a bass player and keyboard player and stuff. So five, five incredibly talented people showed up. And I was lucky enough to understand who I was surrounded with. And I ended up making this record. But that's the first step. The next step is to get a record company interested in you and and have you distributed by a major label. And radio was such a big component of my career and everyone's career at that time. If you're not on the radio, the, there's no alternative. I mean, yes, you can do, you can tour, but it's never as, as I want to say, big and gratifying. So I went to all the labels that knew me already because of my past history, and no one was interested. And I, I remember after you know trying for many months, calling the house, and my mom answered, and I said, "Mom, I'm coming home." And she started crying, but she, what she didn't hear was the rest, which is. I'm going to start my own label. I'm only going to be home for about a month. I'm going to get the song to Canadian border labels so that America can hear me. And I I kind of gave her this whole thing, you know. And to make a long story short, it happened. So I am the songwriter. I am the artist. I'm the producer. And I am the publisher. And I am the record company. So... I've, it taught me the lesson that believe in your dreams. Don't believe in it, what everybody tells you. You can learn from what someone tells you, but you're on your own. Just have faith in what you believe in. And if you, if you try hard and you work hard and surround yourself with magical people, and that happens... It, once they see how dedicated you are. So it gave me the, this wonderful opportunity to not only learn a lesson, but to teach that lesson to anyone who wants to hear it. Well, the lesson that I hear coming through is that you trusted your instincts. You believed in yourself. You listened to your own intuition. I, I, and I'm wondering, hearing that story about Rock Me Gently, do you have any thoughts about the record business today compared to when you started out? Is it any better? Because it doesn't feel that way. Well, you know, it was a smaller playing field then. You know, someone around the world would have to go through the process that someone in Canada or the U.S. would have to go through. But now you can be in your bedroom recording as opposed to uh, listening to a transistor radio to see where your life was going to go. So it's a crowded environment. But I will tell you, those, those companies back then that made all the money, they're still making all the money. So I, I think you have lesser of a chance today than I did when... I was the writer and artist and producer and publisher and all of that, you know. It's easier to get your, your work out, but the playing field is, is universal.
you were the first independent artist. You were really one of the very, very first. Most of the music stars that come on our show today do work independently. They're not with a record company and they don't want to be. But you did it way, way back when nobody was doing that. Well, you know, I never looked over my shoulder about what other people were doing. That wasn't that wasn't part of my DNA. I've never envied anybody. I never thought, you know, I should have done that. Oh, I wish I didn't. I, I am. I'll be honest with you, Harvey. I really live in the moment in 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 a very serious way. I've never been envious of anybody or any of that stuff. It's what am I doing? with my one and only life. What am I doing? Not what is someone else is doing. Not do I wish anything. No, what am I doing? And and that's why I, I continue to believe that, you know, God sent an angel down to help me throughout my life. And, and in return, how are you living that life? It's not about the music. I hear all of those accolades that you said at the beginning but i think deep down inside i'm still the third of four brothers of a mother and father that came into this country as immigrants so i haven't left there yet i think my spirit left but my emotions have not left there and so so i do the christmas shows and and i do stuff and i always try to help new artists to come on and introduce them to a bigger picture. It, it's, it's a wonderful journey that I'm on. Well, it's a wonderful thing that you not only listen to your instincts, which I already mentioned, but you never forgot who you are, where you came from, how you were raised. It's probably the reason why you're still here, why you're still in good health, why you're still in good voice. You've honored your talent by being a good steward of that talent. You know what I mean? Yeah, you know what? I, I, I think when you are actually living your purpose, you're not thinking about your purpose. And so I've, I've, I've kind of been living what I think my purpose is. And I never think about it. I, you know, it, it's... I don't know how to explain it, to be honest with you. It's just, it fills me up to know that there are so many artists today that that need a voice to help them. And the, some of the shows that I do, especially my Christmas shows, offer some of them that opportunity. It's absolutely incredible. You know, I, I have someone that I, that I knew a long time ago. We used to have breakfast in the morning sometime at a place called the City Squire. And his name is Tony Orlando. Oh. And I know you've spoken to him. Yeah. But with all his success and all his ability to kind of move within the entertainment world, he is still he is still just Tony Orlando, who was a publisher and a and someone who Listen to Carol King songs and Jerry Goffin and other Barry Mann and Cynthia Weil and and was a song plugger. And I think deep down inside, he still is that caring human being. And I'm honored to have him as a friend, to be honest. Oh, 100 uh, percent. He's a very dear friend of mine as well. And you, everything you say is 100 percent true. And I think it's true of you, too. Now, Andy, I want to take you back to the moment when you were given your gold record for Rock Me Gently by John Lennon. Can you share with us what went through your mind at that moment? Well, <laughs> you know, kind of a little bit of stun and, and, and panic and not believing. So here's what basically happened. There I was, Capitol Records was distributing Rock Me Gently and, and, and really responsible for bringing it to radio in the U.S. and 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 making it a number one record. You know, there was a gathering on the ninth floor, and and the chairman of 
Capitol had asked me to come to the top floor, the executive office, to talk about doing a tour in India because Baskar Menon himself came from India. So as we were talking, the door opens and there's John Lennon. And the first thing I did is I saw, I saw him and I froze. And what basically happened is he unwrapped this thing that I didn't know what he was doing. And it was my gold record. And he says, Andy Kim, what a great song. Congratulations. And I just, I, I didn't move, Harvey. I couldn't move because if I moved, it would not be true. I'd be, be daydreaming. And as it happened, and he gave me the gold record, Basker Menon <laughs> ushered me out of the room. And he said, I'll see you in the, non, the ninth floor in, in, in a few minutes. To later find out that John Lennon was there promoting whatever gets you through the night. And he was a Capitol Records. The Beatles were on Capitol in the U.S. But two great things happened that I will always remember. It was a radio station, the number one AM station in Los Angeles at that time was KHJ. And, and I think John Lennon, more than the other Beatles, was kind of ubiquitous. He would go anywhere and do whatever it was. And he had God's shield around him. And so he was there promoting whatever gets you through the night with Elton. And there's a countdown. So you count down from 10 all the way to one. And so when they got to the number one record, it was Rock Me Gently. He talked about me, that he met me the day before. And eventually when he recorded in the studio with Phil Spector, I was, I was allowed to hang out and watch the proceedings. So that doesn't happen by any means of the imagination for me. Wow. So that's why I keep saying thank you to God's angel. Oh, for that sure. angel is still around me. And it oh. kind of baptizes the things that I, that I need to do, the things that I would like to do for other people, because I've been given so much. Well, what a memory and what a great way to see your life. I kind of feel like that angel brought you to me. It's quite a remarkable feeling. Now, of course, I have to mention Sugar Sugar. You didn't just co-write that song. You also sang on the recording. Did you have any idea at that time that the song would become such a monumental hit? No. So before, before I give you a couple of thoughts, I originally sang on the demo of it, but my record company did not want me to, to do this because I was in the studio recording Baby I Love You and the record company thought that this was going to be my breakout moment. And there was not much thought given to uh, the comic book of it all, except Don Kirshner that everybody knows through uh, the Midnight Special, but they called him the man with the golden ear. And the fact that he was going to do Sugar Sugar, just going to record it. Nobody knew what was going to happen with it. But they found, they to me, they found the perfect voice in a guy named Ron Dante. And he just did such a great job and it was just so natural for him. I'm amazed it's still alive today when I think about it. May 24th, 1969, Baby I Love You hit the Billboard charts for the first time. May 24th, 1969, the same day, Sugar Sugar was released, but nobody wanted to play it. And I think it, it, it went on the charts sometime in July. And it was kind of a, look, if you look at the environment then with, Woodstock, we're going to the moon, the political unrest in the streets. Nobody really wanted to play a cartoon. You, yeah, what what'd you have? You had um, The Doors and, and all of those great artists at Woodstock. Nobody wanted to play comic book characters. But one station did, and the rest is history. 
Oh, my Lord, is it ever. I can tell you, my bar mitzvah was in 1969. And at the party, people just wanted to play that song over and over and over again. You know, the song Sugar Sugar, it's been recorded by everybody. Wilson Pickett, Ike and Tina Turner, even Bob Marley. How does it feel, Andy, when you hear your song being sung by these great music legends? You know, it it's 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 amazing that I just again it's like it's like John Lennon walking into a, your dream, and and you know before you know it that dream's out the door, but but you you experience that moment with Wilson Pickett. I had a a buddy of mine who was in his band, and so I got to see a couple of Wilson Pickett shows. I've always been a fan of Wilson's. But it went to number four R&B and sold a million records. I have a gold record that says Wilson Pickett. Tina Turner, I can Tina Turner. Look, if you look at my life, nothing was planned. Nothing was for sure. Nothing was planted. It was all a dream. And that dream was manifested by one of God's angels. And so was, everything that I'm talking to you about, I'm almost like, I can talk about it, but it's kind of surreal. It happened. I have no idea. I have no idea what, what sparked the beginning of Sugar Sugar or Rock Me Gently or any of the songs that I wrote, to be honest with you. I don't know where they came from. So they had to come from somewhere. So I'd rather think that it's God's angels helping me along. Yeah, I think it's your destiny, too. Now, in 1980, you released an album under the name of Baron Longfellow. Why did you start yeah. using that name? Well, I, I, had, I had used all my two minutes and 30 seconds, Harvey. And I was writing and wanting other people to hear my songs. And maybe they would record it. And so I, I made demos. I would go in and I'd sing demos. And I figured, okay, you know what? I'm, it's been a great ride. And and maybe somewhere down the way I can do something. And it, it came, the song came to the ear of someone named Gordon Mills. Now, Gordon Mills is from the UK. He manages three other artists before me. The first one was Tom Woodward. He changed his name to Tom Jones. The next one was Jerry Dorsey, and he changed his name to Inkelbert Humperdinck. And the next one, Baby Saddest Children, called Raymond Sullivan, and he became Gilbert O'Sullivan. So when he heard my, my demo and wanted to meet me, he thought at six foot two, dark hair, dark complexion, that I don't look like an Andy Kim. I look like a Baron Longfellow. And that kind of scared me a little bit because he was so adamant about it because that's his platform. So I went around asking friends, you know, and and they said, well, you know, it's, it's a problem because you're already Andy Kim and the bulk of your work is Andy Kim. But you can try it. If it doesn't work, then... You've not advanced anywhere anyway, because your career is almost over, <laughs> if not over, as an as a recording artist. So we went with it. And unfortunately, he passed away before he fulfilled a dream that he had and that allowed me to dream that dream. So I decided, you know what? I love these songs. I'm going to put them out on my own again. And it went on certain radio stations. I think it was, I don't know if it was played in Europe, but it, you know, it did well in South Africa. I always think about that chart. And, and I was nominated in Canada for a Juno would be a Grammy as a writer, as an artist and all of that. And I lost to all of them. But the interesting thing for me was that I always felt that I was 
just going to propel myself to what Gordon's image was of me. So the first time I fell off that that pedestal was, hey, this is this is a new song by an artist named Baron Longfellow, but you know him as Andy Kim. So <laughs> they just canceled everything. So I, I I I rode that wave for maybe a couple of years and and went into obscurity. And then a gentleman by the name of Ed Robertson from the Bare Naked Ladies asked me to write a song with him. So we wrote a song, really loved the song, it was kind of different only because he brought another aspect to my life. You're talking about I Forgot to Mention. Yes, sir. Oh, you my are. Lord. I love that song. That was 2004. And it changed my life. It really did. It, it wasn't a huge international hit, but it was a top 10 hit in Canada and gave me an opportunity to build a base here again. So never stop dreaming. Never stop believing that you're a songwriter. Never stop believing that you have the capacity to sing songs or play music. Don't stop because someone else said no to you. You can't accept someone else's vision of who you are. So the first thing you got to find out is who are you? And what are you doing with your one and only life? Well, you've done good so far, sir. Now, let me ask you about your Christmas show, December the 6th at Massey Hall. This will be your 19th year doing the show. You've raised over $2.3 million for charity over the years, sir. You always bring together an amazing group of artists. I'm just wondering, Andy, are you able to share with us who some of the performers will be this year? Absolutely. Starting with someone who became a friend in 2004, and it's kind of, to some people, it's an odd relationship. But Alex Lifeson from Rush is on the show. He's wow. done the show many times. He's, he's on the show. So is a maestro Fresh West, who's being inducted into the Canadian Hall of Fame in the next few months. I'm so happy for him. There's Men Without Hats. Are you familiar with the safety dance? Yes. <laughs> There's my buddy, Ron Sexsmith. There's the Sadies. There's the Good Brothers. They are absolutely so talented. And in the next, I think by Monday, we'll be adding to that list. What a show that's going to be. I want to tell our viewers that you can learn more about Andy Kim, buy his music, and see his concert schedule by going to his official website, andykimmusic.com. So, Andy, if you had to identify the most personally satisfying experience of your career, what would it be? Has there been one moment that's been the most personally satisfying to you? Going to New York City only knowing two chords, not being a great guitar player, and having the courage to wait outside Lieber and Stoller's office for hours to meet Jeff Barry. And that opened the door to my life. I even played on my own early records. I even played guitar on, you know, those early records. I had a dream and and Jeff Barry helped me design that dream in living life. Did your parents express to you how proud they were of you, of what you achieved? No. I, I think my parents were very old school. I guess I'm old school, too. But I, I've talked to my older brothers about it, you know, and said, you know, I never heard this. And he said, well, that, that was the time because I have two older brothers. And then there are, I don't know, quite a few years later that my kid brother and I were born. And, uh, as I said, we grew up in the tenements and didn't know it was the tenements. Most of, most of the kids I went to school with lived in within you know 
a broken doors moment of of living their lives but i think they kind of my mom and dad just kind of wanted me to be home i used to fly home once a week used to take eastern airlines i don't know if you remember eastern airlines I sure do from new york city and have dinner and then i my mom would cry when she saw me and she'd cry when i left and then it became every two weeks because I, I couldn't take the emotion of it all because I was really defined on um, wanting to live this life. So I did run away from home. Well, Not I have because a feeling... of love or anything, but because I knew something was waiting for me. I have a feeling that w even if they didn't tell you, they must have been enormously proud of you. And I know that wherever they are now, they must be. And I'm just wondering, listening to you, do you have any interest in sitting down and writing a memoir? Look at the life you've lived. Look at the lessons you've you've got to teach us all. You know, I, I never thought I was a teaching moment or a storytelling moment on still, you know, I, I started talking to people uh, in the past few years about who and what I am and, and, and family. And I am a sum total of being the third of four brothers. That's who I am. And that's how I've always seen myself. But there's um, a book there. There's a book there, Andy. Look at Well, the if there's an author that you know that can help me write that book, then I, I will give them, you know, everything I know and put their name on that book because... I don't know where to start. I'm going to leave it with me. You leave, have a deal. Leave it with me. <laughs> I'm telling you, I think it's such an important, it's such an important story you're telling. It resonates with every child of immigrants, including myself. It resonates with everybody who has a dream that appears to be completely unreachable. It resonates with anybody who's ever struggled with persistence, with perseverance, with reinventing yourself. Uh, I'm just, I've got to tell you, it's been a huge honor meeting you and having this chance to chat with you about your amazing career. Thank you for all the music, all the joy, the entertainment you've brought us over the years. Congratulations on the Order of Canada appointment. Best of luck with the Christmas show. And most of all, thank you so much for taking the time to appear on our show, Andy. You know, I, 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 as I said when we started, I, I've watched your show and I've thought of all those incredible artists and guests you've had on, and now I'm, I'm one of them. So that's another, it's, that's another like really, really exciting moment in my life. So thank you very much. It's been my honor, believe me. Our guest has been the legendary music superstar Andy Kim. And to all of our Toronto viewers, remember that tickets to the Andy Kim Christmas show on December the 6th can be purchased online at masseyhall.com and ticketmaster.ca. Tickets are selling quickly, so please don't delay. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to my producer, Steve Silver, my director of programming, Deborah Batsafin, my production assistant, Rosa Puzo, and my entire team at the XPTV1 network in the UK. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.